David Bizard here, and you are watching Paratech 10. If you can give me 10 or 20 minutes of your time, I will pass on many of the things that I've been able to learn in a career building high performance and race engines, uh, winning race engines that is. Anyway, just give me that chance to show you what I can teach you and I think you will find that you're well rewarded. In this episode, the subject is going to be some details that you were probably not aware of concerning ignition and swirl. Now, first off, they may seem like two completely different things, but as you will see, they are interconnected. Before we go on, let me give you a little of my background concerning ignition systems. It all started, more or less, when I began racing minis back in about, oh, 1961. I started racing in 58 with a A35, but about 1961 we're looking at here. As soon as circumstances allowed the use of longer cams, one thing became very evident. The problem of contact breaker bounce reared its ugly head. And although we had an engine with an 8,000 RPM potential, we could barely scrape past about 68, maybe 7,000 RPM. For those youngsters amongst you, here simplified is how a contact breaker ignition system worked. It's called a Kettering system after the guy that named it. Basically what happens is the cam on the uh, uh, distributor shaft opens a set of contact breakers and when they open the back EMF from the primary winding induces about 200 volts in the primary winding which the primary winding of the coil which gets stepped up in the secondary right the coil is basically a transformer that secondary voltage reaches 40,000 volts fires a spark plug. Problem. If those contact breakers don't break cleanly and in a controlled fashion, the ignition system goes to hell in a handbasket right now. To get the best out of any kind of points slash contact breaker system, it's necessary to use a dwell meter to set the dwell. And what that does is it maximizes the time the coil has to build up a magnetic field that we can then break the points on and have it collapse. So setting up the distributor with a dwell meter was a positive deal. Now here's the problem. Um, they only stayed set up for a short time. So this was something we had to do before every race right to get the best out of the car now it was necessary for us to take all of these um, uh, how shall I say means of increasing performance because we didn't have enough money to run a race car right so we had to do the very best that circumstances would allow us so what happened here was that I found that Urson cams ground uh, a distributor cam which they designed using cam timing a uh, practice right so it opened very fast and closed gently so that point bounce was not an issue the other thing was is we used to select points which had the strongest force to seat them thereby giving us the most rpm before the points went into a physical points bounce. When that happened, the power just nosedive. About 1965, I got to build a transistor ignition system. That all came about when I read the term 
transistor-assisted contacts in some SAE paper. It wasn't talking about ignition, it was a, another subject, but I immediately grasped what was going on here. And that set me on a quest to build one from design and build one for myself. It's very fortunate that I worked in an experimental lab where prototypes abounded and I could find the components in scrapped parts. The thing that I looked for the hardest was a big power transistor. I should point out that I didn't invent this thing. I just cottoned on to the idea from the description in that SAE paper. Anyway, I built this system and essentially it worked by virtue of the fact that the contact breaker now only needed a very small gap and was only switching 12 volts, switched the transistor and the big power transistor handled the current and voltage that the rest of the uh, uh, circuitry needed. Result was when we tested on a, uh, a spin fixture which we used the workshop lathe with belts on it to drive it at the requisite RPM. We, we got it up to 9,000 and the ignition ran perfectly. So, big step forward there. Now, on to the next move. The next step in my experience with ignition systems started when my boss came to me and asked if I would participate in the design finalization of a ground to air guided missile. Uh, this would be for the Army and Navy and to a lesser extent the Air Force. Anyway, it sounded like an interesting project so I said, hey, sure. Well, um, it was necessary for me to get some uh, military weapons advice from this professor who lived in London. So, to get the ball rolling, I started off uh, with a visit to this guy, Professor Davis, an incredible character. And I got the advice I needed, and uh, interestingly enough, he took me to, into his workshop, which was a large uh, shed-like building, inconspicuous, but, but fairly large, maybe a thousand square feet, at the bottom of his garden in London. And uh, he opened the door to, uh, to it, and I noticed there's a very large, complex padlock on there right um not padlock lock and uh open the door and then much to my surprise the whole interior of the shop was how shall i say lined with iron bars thick ones i'm talking about inch thick and i said to him what's with all the cage work in here and he said well as you may suspect, I do a lot of top secret work for the government. I'm the uh, advisor to the Minister of Defense on military uh, developments and the like. If this shop is broken into, I'm wired direct to the police station about 800 yards down the road. If this shop gets broken into, Somebody better be here armed to the teeth in 90 seconds to make sure whoever broke in doesn't make it, doesn't escape. Really, that's interesting. Anyway, so we spent the day talking about this, that and the other and uh, the subject got around to the fact that I race a Mini and, I, and he says, oh, so uh, anything interesting on it? And I said, well, I did make a transistor ignition system for it. Really? He said, that's interesting. I'm working on one 
now a transistor ignition system. It, um, it works by virtue of uh, a switch in polarity. So it, it fires uh, from the side electrode to the center electrode and then from the center electrode to the side electrode. Right, so you get two big sparks, uh, pretty close together. Um, and, and he said, "Would you like?" He said, "You ever do any dyno testing?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I go to a place in Birmingham that's got a chassis dyno, and I sometimes go down to um, uh, Plymouth, uh, where there's a, a dyno down there that I use." So. A few weeks later, I get this ignition system, and we go ahead and try it. There comes a time when you can have an adequate spark, and it turns out that a mini engine gets a very much of an adequate spark very early on. Slightly different to things like um, uh, uh, big block Chevrolet or s some other engines, right? Especially four valve engines. Um, so we proved that with a Mini, if you had a bad spark, it dropped off very quickly. If you had an adequate spark, it was good. If you had a super good spark, it got a little bit better. And then if you, you from there on, you could go to bolts of lightning and it didn't make any difference. It was going to light up. But other engines, that's not the case. Probably about a year later, after this dyno testing, um, the uh, aftermarket industry started blooming in terms of uh, electronic ignition systems and the amount of BS that was put out there to advertise them was unbelievable. This is where truth in advertising can be disguised. The up to phrase was extensively used now, the up to phrase goes like this, up to 20% more power, up to 25% more economy. Well, these numbers were grossly exaggerated, but they were stating the top amount that you're likely to get, right? The reality is, is that if you had a good stock ignition system, that the advantages were more in terms of getting rid of the points. Your points ignition system, when properly tuned over the RPM range the engine was going to run in, could deliver very close to what a, transistor, a transistorized ignition system could. So, what we can say is that the industry was full of pseudo BS. And the other thing is, uh, a little while after this boom started, I started writing for a magazine, uh, or, uh, then highly uh, published, widely published a performance magazine. And I, I remember several of these companies approached me and said, we'll let you have a super deal on one of these ignition systems if you'd like to write about it. And I said to them, no, it doesn't work like that. If you want me to write about this, you let me have one to test for nothing. I mean, you can have it back after. I don't care. Right? Oh, no, 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 we can't do that. Look, we'll let you have an ignition system and we'll give you the guidelines on what to write. And I said, oh, that doesn't work either. No, I do the tests. And I write what I find. You don't have anything to say. The publisher pays me to do it, so you can't even pay me to write about it. Well, needless to say, it was some years before I tested any of those ignition systems and wrote about them. Now, I did test some. I didn't particularly like them. They didn't seem to do much more than what mine were doing, but I thought I'd throw that in right, in case you thought that there was some giant leap forward uh, done at this step, stage, uh, period, whatever words you want to use there.
Just for the moment, let's leave the ignition system itself and take a look at the spark plugs and cables. First, spark plug heat range. What makes the difference between a hot spark plug and a cold spark plug? Hopefully this following diagram will illustrate that. The, the essence here is that a hot spark plug has a long heat path and a cold running spark plug has a short heat path. Right, and it's all to do with how fast it sucks the heat out of the uh, uh, electrodes. So why do we have all these different heat ranges? Well, not all engines run at the same temperatures, right? A high output engine may have much more heat to dispose out of the spark plug to stop it overheating than say a lawnmower engine. And the reason we need the plug to run at a certain temperature is primarily to burn off deposits so that the plug doesn't misfire. Now, like I've said, the more powerful the ignition system is, the less the plug electrode design plays into things here. If we've got a, a race engine, the best bet, especially if it's a drag race engine and you're not going to foul the plug up very quickly at all, is to run a plug that you definitely know is too cold for the job but you're running an ignition system which will blast through anything in terms of deposits on the plugs. I've had ignition systems where you could dunk the plug in oil, connect it up and blast right through that oil with a spark, whereas a normal ignition system would just sit there and look at you and say, what? One last point, extended nose spark plugs almost always work better than those with plug electrodes that are close to the chamber wall. Getting that spark out into the chamber nine times out of ten works. So always try and run an extended nose spark plug. Under the subject plug electrode design and the rip-offs perpetrated in the name of science. Over the years there's been many attempts to optimize the spark by virtue of changes in plug gap design. We've got the surface discharge plug very often used in two-stroke engines where there's no real electrode, just a center electrode and the shell around the outside. And the spark jumps from the center electrode directly to the shell across an insulator. Needs a pretty powerful ignition to fire that. They can in some cases work though. I used those in my Group 1 car. That was the plug brought about by dyno testing. The choice solely depended on power output. The plug design that's probably more familiar to many of you, maybe not so much the very younger ones, the teenagers amongst my viewers, but is the split fire plug. That's where the plug side electrode was split at the end. And uh, the intent of that was to give you the impression that it fired two plug, two sparks there, not one. Never did. The chance of it firing two two sparks is very, very remote. Everything would have to be identical on both electrodes and that happening is not really going to, uh, there isn't much chance of that. So anyway, I did quite a bit of dyno testing on split fire plugs and quite honestly, they were next best thing to a ripoff. They were made by, I think it was either AC or uh, Autolite and the company that made them had actually uh, tested split electrodes like that many, many years previously, and the intent was to patent it, but they found it didn't work. However, they were quite happy to make the plugs for Splitfire because Splitfire was their customer. 
and they sold plugs by the tens of millions. The bottom line was it was the cheapest plug that could be made. And uh, to be honest, it wasn't a very good plug. But anyway, so that's the uh, deal on split fire. Now let's look at those fine electro plugs, the platinum plugs and the iridium plugs and things like this made by Bosch and NGK. Essentially, they're very good plugs. However, I would caution you against using them with a nitrous engine because the plug electrodes are easier to overheat and lead to detonation than a regular plug. Now, are they much better than regular plugs? Well, yes, in as much as you can probably go 100,000 miles without replacing them. But let's look at the performance side of spark plugs alone here. Let's not worry about exactly how long they last. If they go 10,000 miles, that's fine. Now, the thing is, is that plug design becomes less important the more powerful the ignition is. And it gets to the point where the plug electrode design is virtually irrelevant. I, I spoke about a, a, um, an electrode, sorry, an ignition system that put a huge arc like an arc welding torch across the plug gap. Well, to be honest, it didn't really matter what you had for an electrode. It was going to put a massive ignition kernel across that gap and the mixture was going to light up, period. But let's home in on something a bit nearer to uh, practicality here. Um, it's a good idea to bear in mind that the spark in a gap tends to jump from the hottest point on the center electrode to the hottest point on the side electrode. Now, what we need to do is grind the plug, reshape the plug, such that we know exactly where the hottest point is going to be. And that is always on a corner. So what we can do here is reshape the plug as per this photograph coming up and we find that the spark consistently goes from the corner of the side electrode to the corner of the center electrode because that's the two hottest points there. A plug tip electrode design that is getting some traction here is the E3 uh, deal. This has uh, an electrode which has three legs and it goes across the center electrode and has a square hole in the top. And um, uh, it does work. I, uh, I took one of my optimalized set of plugs uh, and tested the E3 versus that in a relatively mild 350 Chevy engine. Results coming up. Now you'll see at low RPM it's slightly less horsepower. That is not because the plug is any worse or anything like this. That was due to the fact that it required a slight change in ignition timing there. Uh, needed to be retarded because it got the flame going, flame front going better. So those figures are almost certainly lower due to the fact the timing is slightly too far advanced. But as we go up in RPM range, so that situation rectifies itself. And you can see that at the top end, there is a little over two horsepower increase. Now that doesn't sound much, right? But remember, the plugs I'm testing it against were also about two horsepower, maybe three up on a regular tip spark plug. So, E3 plugs work. Now, the interesting thing is, is this is patented. And uh, there's a story behind this, one which could, if I so chose, allow me to invalidate their patent by virtue of uh, something called prior art. And we'll go into exactly what that involves now.
somewhere around 94, 95, I was doing quite a bit of work on restricted circle track engines. And uh, one of the areas that I worked on was ignition. Can't afford to give away anything on those restricted engines. Has to be right up there, otherwise it's just not competitive. Anyway, I had this idea for a new electrode, right? What I was going to do was try and create as long an edge as possible for the plug to fire. That means I wanted a very, very, how should I say, a line of high temperature material in the electrodes so that it could fire between any of those points and with the idea of it lasting longer because the line that it could fire on was longer than that design I've just shown you with the electrode rounded. Now, what I did here was to get an electrode which I flattened the side electrode, drilled a hole in it, shaped it, and then continued drilling all the way through to the center electrode and dished that out so that there, it was like a crater. The edge of that electrode coincided with the edge of the hole here. And it worked very well. And it had a property which is well worth enlightening you on at this point. Let me backtrack a moment in terms of um, uh, electrical characteristics of a spark plug gap. With a conventional plug, what we see is the more spark we want, the bigger the gap has to be. But the bigger the gap, the harder it is to ionize it. So, you want a big spark, big gap, needs a lot of power. Now, the plug design that I had, had a unique property, at least I think it's unique, it took a lot less energy to fire it than the amount of energy it created in the gap. In other words, with something like about two thirds of the voltage, it would dump about the same amount of energy in the gap as a plug, conventional plug, with half as much again uh, plug gap. So, what we had here was a plug that was easy to fire, put a lot of energy in the gap. Did it work? Sure did. To do all the final uh, uh, development work on this plug and to arrange for sales and things like this, I teamed up with a very smart professor at the University of Hamburg. And uh, between us, we uh, perfected the design, did a lot of testing, and presented it to Silverton. That's a German spark plug company. They make all the spark plugs for OE stuff for BMWs and Mercedes, or at least they did do. And they liked the idea, but it got stalled. And here's why. The plans for my professor friend and I to make a fortune started to unravel at PRI about 1996. And here's what happened. I was at somebody's booth and uh, this guy approached me and thanked me for giving him the tech for him to win seven Formula Ford Sports 2000 championships in a row. Or, or more or less in a row. And I told him he was very welcome. And we got chatting about what my, he got this information mostly from my uh, two liter Pinto book, which was published oh, way back 1983, 84 time, right? Interestingly enough, I sent a copy to Ford's performance division and their chief engineer wrote back and said this is one of the most well-researched hot rod books I've ever come across. It must have cost you a fortune to do all this R&D. Well it did. 
but the book sold pretty good, so I, I guess I got most of it back. Didn't make a profit on it, but anyway, it's beside the point. We got talking about engines, and he happened to say something along the lines of, hey, one of the things I found was uh, interesting concerning spark plugs. What I did was I drilled a hole in the side electrode straight into the center electrode, right, and, and then rounded the tip off, and that gave a bit more power. And I looked at my professor friend and I thought to myself, we've just lost millions of dollars. Prior art. Well, time's bad up on this video. Um, in part two, I'm going to start with uh, plug cables and a few things you should know about plug cables, right? So that will be the starting point. But meanwhile, please, let me remind you to subscribe, like, share, and notify. And on top of that, one more imposition. Please hit the thanks button with the dollar sign on it. And thank you for watching.